quick shameless plug, everybody, to check out my other podcast, The Tech Meme Ride Home. It's a daily podcast posting every Monday through Friday. And it's a quick 15-minute rundown of the biggest news that day in the world of technology. I'd love it if you went over and gave it a try, but I'd love it even more if you hit subscribe and gave it a try for a week. Again, Tech Meme Ride Home. Search it in your podcast app. Thanks. Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Today we have a man who needs no introduction, New York Times technology columnist Farhad Manju. This episode was recorded about two months or so ago, so we talk about the book leave that Farhad is on that he only recently made public. But of course, we get into his whole career and his unique vantage point and views on the world of technology. Please enjoy. Farhad Manju, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I've discovered this is my really kind of go-to entryway question, but um, if you can remember, uh, tell me what was the first computer that was either solely yours and or the first computer that you interacted with meaningfully. Maybe it was the family's computer or whatever. Um, making models not necessary, but you, you get nerd points if you remember that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I totally remember. Um, it was in the 1980s. Um, I lived in South Africa. I was born in South Africa. Um, so it was like a British, um, so South Africa is like a British colony or has close British ties. And so the comp- yes. Yeah. So uh, the computer was some British company called Sinclair. Yep, Does uh-huh. this ring a bell? Yes. Absolutely. You know this? Yep. 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 Um, it was a little, um, keyboard type thing that you plugged into um you plugged into a tv um my sort of vivid memory so i so the thing that we mostly did on it is played um video games um the video games were very rudimentary they were atari like um this was like what 1985 maybe Mm -hmm. so i was like seven Mm -hmm. um and you loaded the games from um uh, they were on um, a four-track tape, so like you connected the tape to the um, machine, to the computer, and like it played like modem-type sounds. And then like after a while, like 20 minutes or so, the game would load and you'd play. And it was like, um, you know, like Space Invaders-type games. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing um, you could do on it was like program in BASIC. And so at a very early age, I sort of understood and like appreciated the power of programming. Um, and I was totally sort of hooked on this machine. Um, I remember they had like a little manual that explained basic programming. Um, I must've been older than seven, I guess. Cause I, I, me- I remember being able to read it. So I was literate. Um, but, uh, and I remember sort of, you know, looking at that, learning about computers and just like falling instantly for computers. And like, I've been, um, kind of on and off using computers ever since. Did you, did you actually, uh, write up little programs for yourself or was it like sort of, you know, following the guide and, and doing. Yeah, it things? was, it was following the guide. So you wrote out whatever was in the, um, in the basic guide. And then like, what was cool about it was like, you could tweak it and then see what happened if you change things around and, 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 and the tweaking sort of taught you what, what the commands meant and kind of gave you a basic idea of basic. Um, it was totally fun. And, you know, I'm not a programmer. I like, um, took a bunch of programming courses in, in college. Um, but I, and so I appreciate the ideas embedded in it, but like that gave me an introduction to computers and the ideas of how computers worked. And, um, also like made me think for a while that like becoming working in the tech industry in some way would be interesting. So, uh, you mentioned you, you grew up in South Africa. When do you move uh, to the States? You're like eight or something like that? Um, yeah. So I, 
I was, um, it was 1987, so nine. And you moved to Southern California? Yep. Um, I, it's funny, this is totally an aside, but I was just listening to Charlize Theron on the uh, Bill Simmons podcast, and she's talking about losing her accent. And uh, did, so did you have to lose a, a, what is it, Africans or South African accent? Yeah, it's funny. I, I, um, I, I mean, I, I felt like obviously I had an accent when we moved and I was kind of self-conscious about it enough that um, I remember kind of trying to mask my accent or pretend to have an American accent in like third grade. Um, and, you know, pretty quickly, I think lost the accent. And now I'm really bad at accents and can't even fake a South African accent or mm. kind of any accent. So I feel bad about it because I um because so, it'd be wait, cool to you, have you, that accent. You've totally lost it, is what you're saying. I've totally lost it, um, and can't can't fake it. That's funny because Bill Bill Simmons was saying, you know, because he got rid of his Boston accent and he's like, yeah, but when I get drunk, <laughs> it comes out. He's like, I can't I can't hold it down. So I don't know. Um, all right, sorry, yeah. that was a tangent. That um, does not happen to me. <laughs> interesting. Uh, all right, so then the second part of the question would be, um, what was the first computer that was, this is Farhad's computer? Um, so we, we moved to America. Um, I really, really, really wanted a computer. I didn't have that one that was worked in South Africa anymore. Um, it was probably like maybe 1990, 1991. And we got, um, I like begged my parents for, um, for a computer and we got a Tandy computer Love from Radio it. Shack. Yeah. Um, and it was, I'm trying to remember it was, it didn't have a hard drive. Um, so you sort of had to load everything with floppies. Um, like first you had to, put in like the dos disk exactly. and then put in like did you have app. the did you have the dual drives or you only had that one drive i think there was only one drive so i think you had to switch it out right um, yeah because i my first one um had at least the dual drive so you would you would keep the dos disk in a and then you would load whatever you wanted it to be yeah no this was um this was just one and then and i don't really i don't really remember what i did with that like i don't really remember i think I suspect it was mostly for games. Maybe there was like also basic programming on it. Um, but I don't really remember what else I did with it. Like it was not, um, it was a machine that I think I used often, but not like a lot, not, not, um, yeah, it wasn't sort of like hooked on it. Um, then we got a couple other computers, um, sort of like one that did have a hard drive. I remember, and then, um, and, but the first one that I, first computer that I like used the internet or it wasn't the internet, it was, um, it was Prodigy, ah, which, um, uh, was, uh, a computer that we had, I guess, I don't, I guess it might've been, what was that brand? Um, Packard, Packard, Packard Bell. Bell. Packard, Packard Bell. Bell. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Packard Bell. Who sold that? It was like a store brand, right? Yeah, and I think it was was it Circuit City that was heavily Packard Bell, because I know yeah. I had one too. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna feel like it was Circuit City that that was that tended to be the, because it it you know it felt like they were selling HPs but they weren't HPs. It was Packard Bell. So like, right. yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that so that was the first computer that had it, it had a twenty megabyte hard drive. Um, which was big enough that you, like it could, it had its own, um, you know, it had DOS and some kind of like application, um, like application launcher software that wasn't, um, it wasn't Windows. It, um, it was just sort of like Packard Bell's own thing. And, um, and I think I mostly played games on it also. Um, but I remember there was this program called, um, Harvard Graphics. Do you remember that? No. Mm -mm. It was like a. Um, it was some. It was a kind of a mix between, like what like slideshow software between like PowerPoint and um, and like 
some rudimentary kind of animation program. And what was really cool about it was like you could um, it had like a logo like um, uh, language and then you could sort of create graphics and like, um, you know, play with animations and stuff. So I did that a lot. I remember sort of like I have a sort of a very vivid memory of like writing these like animation type things. Yeah, um, we, when we used to do, you know, movies, we would, you know, all the kids in the neighborhood would make movies on VHS and whatever. And so for the opening uh, title sequence, I, it was a similar program that escapes me now, but like we would always animate it that way. So like the name of the, the movie would like float in from the side and things like that. And you just stick the VHS in front of it <laughs> like out of frame because you couldn't load it onto the VHS or whatever. But yeah. 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 Um, I don't, I don't think that that was the computer that I first used to get on prodigy but mm -hmm. it may have been but i but like in any case prodigy was the first sort of online service that i used and then i think so one of my i didn't quite understand how like the phone charging worked like how how they charged you for sort of being on prodigy yeah, yeah. You, you paid like a you paid like a price to prodigy and then you also paid for like the length of the phone call. And I didn't quite know that. And I remember my dad being really upset because I'd like run up a huge phone bill one time. Um, and I, I remember prodigy was like super, it was super fun. I remember it being fun. Like you could just like, just the idea of like chatting with people on there was cool. Um, but I think that the, the real kind of my, my first, um, uh, like real internet experience was, um, what was what was that company it it was not netscape it was the one it was something with an n uh, that ele go ahead go ahead uh it was like uh you know an internet service provider net it wasn't zero. aol net zero no not net no. zero um it was, some, it was anyway it was spry that made internet in a box no, that would have been around. That. Okay, it was like Net Serve or something. It was it was kind of like AOL, but mm -hmm. it didn't have the AOL service. It had like it was an ISP. Oh, okay. Um, it, it had those um like there were uh, CDs that you could get everywhere. Like they mm -hmm. gave them out for free. Yeah. Kind of before AOL ramped up. It, it literally could be something as generic as Netcom or something like that. I think it was Netcom. Yeah, that yeah. Might have been it. Um. Anyway. But, uh, I got that and like um, convinced my parents to like switch to that from Prodigy, and then that allowed you to get like the web and um, and Gopher and stuff. This was so this was um, this was like super early. It was like 1994. Yeah. Um, so I remember downloading um, like the Netscape browser on that and like loading up web pages. There was like nothing you could do. It was super slow, but it was like cool. Um, no experience with uh, BBSs or anything like that? Like No, yeah. no. Um, well, no, like, none that... I don't remember... Um, I don't remember, like, participating in BBSs or anything, but I remember, like, being interested in, like, running my own BBS mm. <laughs> at, like, as, like, an 11-year-old. Because I remember, like, downloading the software that, like, allowed you to create your own, but then I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. But no, not really. Uh, you, you would you would store and look for porn. That's what everybody did with BBSs. Um, so I, I, I said I said offline I, we're almost exactly the same age. So you go to college around what ninety six ninety seven? Yeah, ninety six. So um, what are what are you going to school for? Well, first of all, what 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 do your parents do? What are you what are you supposed to be doing when you go to college? Um. You mean what do my parents do for work? Yeah, yeah. So my dad is a pharmacist. My mom was mostly at home. Um, I, I would say the other thing that's sort of interesting is like the first, the first time that I was like really, um, I think I was interested in computers because my dad had this computer at his pharmacy in South Africa hmm. that like I I was like that sort of revolutionized his pharmacy. He was like the, one of the first people to um, get a computer um, as a pharmacist. And like he got some special like pharmacy software or something. And I, I really liked the idea of like him running the, um, the, the store on this software. So I thought that was interesting. And then um, uh, um, what was your other question? Well, so when you All go right. to college, is it the idea that you're going to be a pharmacist or, or what do you, what do you want? Oh, yeah. Uh, no. So um, 
uh, were ethnically Indian. My parents wanted me to be a doctor. Mm. Um, I had no interest in being a doctor. Um, pretty much was always interested in like reading and writing. And did, um, did, did, did you tell them that you were going to be a doctor or? Um, I, I like that was like a that was like, I dangled that possibility I think for a while, but like pretty quickly after I got to college, I was like, uh, no, I'm not going to be a doctor. Um, I mean the other sort of my, my other kind of twin obsession, um, other than technology was like always the news. Like I'm just kind of a news junkie. And like the thing that I did when I, um, when I got access to the internet is like read the news. Um, hmm. I, I, I would like read the New York Times. Um, so I live in California. We didn't really like get the New York Times. Um, I mean, I guess they delivered it, but I didn't know about the New York Times in California. Um, but I would read it online. They had a website like in very early, like 96. 95 or something. Yeah. It was yeah. 96, yeah. Um, and so suddenly I could like read the newspaper as like a, you know, high school senior, I guess. Um, and it was like just this man, like, the fact that I work there now is like kind of incredible because I've just have all, you know since then just been like the hugest fan of like the news and um, so you know when I went to college I like joined the um, college newspaper I um, worked there all the time eventually became the editor um, it was pretty clear like very early in my like college career that like I was heading to become some kind of writer or journalist or something in in that field and not um, not medicine. Is that the degree you got in journalism? Um, no, I actually studied economics and because um, uh, I thought economics was super interesting. I mean, so first I took a bunch of um, computer science classes, uh, but uh, getting a computer science degree uh, at Cornell like required just kind of all of your time. And I knew that I wanted to spend most of my time at the college newspaper. And so economics was like a mix between, um, you know, something I was interested in um, and also there were v fewer classes to, that you had to take. So it, it was like a good, uh, a good, like a sort of a life lifestyle type major. So when you graduate, um, what, uh, what's the first job you get or, or, or what are you looking to do? And, and what I'm leading to is I know you, you get to salon in about 2002, but so if you graduate around 2000, 2001, like I did, what's, what happens in that year to 18 months after graduating? Uh, I worked at, um, wired. So wired, uh, wired was two things. Then it was a website. Um, and it was the magazine and they were owned by separate companies. I worked at the website. Um, and probably the reason you couldn't find that is because like, I think all of those archives are, are gone. Are gone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I worked there from 2000 to 2002. Um, it was, uh, I was the last person. So it was owned by, um, Lycos, mm -hmm. that web search company, mm -hmm. um, which was in turn owned by the Spanish company called right. Terra. Right. Um, and so is this, and you know, this was, I was hired in 2000 sort of boom time. Um, how do you get hired? Like just, um, I want to be a journalist. Hire me. Like, wh how do you get to work? Yeah, I, I mean, there were jobs in, in California. So I wanted to move out to California. I didn't want to go to Southern California. I knew I wanted to, like, live in the Bay Area because I was, like, obsessed with the tech industry. And um, and I was, the I was the editor of the college newspaper and was looking for journalism jobs in the Bay Area. Um, there were several of them, like many people were hiring then, you know, there were lots of new tech publications hiring like young writers. Um, I applied to, I think CNET and didn't hear anything. And I applied to this wired job and I got hired. Like, they, um, I was in, I was in my last year of college and got an interview. Like I, I applied by like email, um, maybe a few months before I graduated, um, and got, uh, you know, got a response saying, come to San Francisco for an interview. I did. And I got hired <laughs> and, and then I moved to San Francisco and worked there. Well, so again, you probably had a similar experience to me, which is you're entranced by tech. You, you want to join the, the party and right when you get there, the party ends. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I was, so I was the, um, there were people hired after me, 
that was the very last pe- person hired by um, by Wired Wired News. It was called. That was what the website was called. Um, but I was the very last person who's hired who wasn't. Um, everyone who was hired after me was laid off. Like in the first sort of wave of layoffs, they like just did it by seniority, and so all those people who came after me were laid off. And I um, um, probably would have been laid off if I'd stayed longer, because I think eventually lots of people there were laid off. Um, but um, then I, in 2002, I saw this job at Salon and, um, to be, a, um, to cover the tech industry at Salon. And I was a huge fan of Salon. It was, it was totally interesting. So I, I was, was going to say, because you're mentioning being a, a news nerd, like you, if in the late nineties, you could have been reading Salon and Slate both. Yep. I mean, I was reading Salon from like when it started. I remember kind of its coverage of like the, um, 2000 election of, even before then, of like the impeachment, um, I remember Jake, stuff, Jake, yeah. yeah, Jake Tapper, right, was, yeah, uh, yeah. By the, the way, big... here's a, here's a little uh, internet history uh, nerd factoid for you. Jake Tapper was the first uh, journalist to get credentials to cover a presidential election. The first web journalist. Oh, really? Yeah. For Salon? Yes, exactly. I did not know that. Um, so. Yeah, so I went to work for Salon. I was um, a huge fan, and uh, and I was there from 2002 to 2006 or so. I took a couple years off, or I took a year off to write a book, um, and then I went to Slate in 2008. Yeah. So what is online is your Salon uh, back catalog. I don't know if it's complete, but it, it goes... I, saw... I don't think it's complete, because yeah. there's... Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's not there. But well, yeah. so let's. I want to get into that a little bit. So, I, and we're going to come back to this this notion of people that I, I knew of as bloggers when I first discovered them, and you're one of them. But, mm-hmm. um, so when you get to Salon, early two thousands, uh, Salon's an online only pe- publication. Is it sort of like that? Uh, blogging sort of metabolism? Are you expected to churn out pieces every day, multiple pieces a day, that sort of thing? No, it's not at all. It it operated very much like um, a, a magazine, I think. You know, working at a weekly would have been like that. Working at Time or something would have been like what working at Salon was like. I wrote a piece about, um, in the Times, I wrote a piece about Gawker uh, when Gawker shut down. And in there, I... Um, I explained that both Slate and Salon, you know, just functioned basically like magazines, um, like print magazines until uh, until Gawker came along. I think Gawker, mm-hmm. I mean, blogging and, and Gawker was sort of the big first big commercial success there, um, really pushed the web forward in, in, in its metabolism. And um, but that was at a time that was sort of bef- um, after my start. Right. So uh, I. I got to Salon, and even at Slate, when I was at Slate, it it still was kind of slow. Um, and so I've never, I um, I had a blog at Salon, but even there, it wasn't kind of a multiple times per day blog. Um, I've never worked at a place where I had to write, um, you know, at the kind of at web speed. <laughs> um, at Salon, when I first got there, I think I was writing once or twice, like once a week at the most. And sometimes it was like every other week. Mm-hmm. Um, and the stories were, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 words. Um, and, and so that's, Are you specifically yeah. on the tech beat at that point? Because, again, I mean, a lot of the stuff in, that I could find in the archives, it's it's there's political stuff at the time, but it's maybe that was political stuff that tech overlapped with or things like that. I was hired to be the tech writer, and then – I I was allowed to do whatever I wanted. Um, so it was great. I mean, it was a small staff, and we just covered whatever we thought was interesting. There were probably only about six or seven like full-time writers there. Um, there was a uh, there was Jake Tapper in Washington and someone else in Washington. Um, and so they covered sort of very very clear Washington politics stories. But everything else was, kind of fair game and um the audience at salon was mostly interested in politics yeah and and mostly interested in like lefty politics kind yes. of anti-bush politics and so um 
that was kind of what the content was. Um, like if I was writing a straight tech story, I don't think people would have read it. So you sort of, you sort of, um, wrote about tech through the lens of politics. Um, and that was true also at Slate. Um, or not, not that I read about politics, but, but it was, um, also a small, uh, magazine with without a lot of full-time writers and so that allowed you to allowed me to kind of cover pretty much anything i thought was interesting can i give you a a couple greatest hits from at least the salon archive because i'm going to give you credit for a couple things here uh in mid 2004 uh at salon you're writing an article when technology became cool again and you're basically calling web 2.0's arrival i don't think you actually even use the term web 2.0 because it probably hadn't been coined yet uh, but you're talking about like blogs and firefox and google and things like that and so like you know calling the nuclear winter being over and and tech is coming back again i thought that was yeah is that is that the one where i um i talked to uh maybe ev williams for for oh shit i must not have read far enough <laughs> Or, or, um, cause you have, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't Ev. It, it was, you have a couple in 2004 where you're talking about Ted or tech being uh, resurgent and uh, Renaissance. Yeah. I, I remember that time. It was really interesting. There were, you know, lots of companies kind of figuring out new ways to use the web. Um, companies that I was really interested in. I think I wrote about, um, Odeo, the company that became Twitter. Yeah. yeah, that became Twitter. Um, and then what's that? Oh, the company that's now called Bootcamp. That was 37 Signal, Signals. Oh, Basecamp. Yeah. 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 37 Signals. I read about them often. They were all sort of using, you know, new programming techniques to make the web more dynamic. Um, and they were, and you know, Flickr was one of them too. They um, they came about at this time where people thought the tech industry was dead or dying or just not that vibrant. And then it had just been a fad. The internet yeah. had been a fad. Yeah. Yeah. And they were sort of proving, um, that it wasn't, uh, I'll give you a, a, another couple of real quick ones. Uh, parents are taking over Facebook. I think that's 2007. Maybe, um, you review the first iPhone for salon. And yeah, then, I remember that. Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, I, well, so what I, I, the part, I don't remember what I wrote, but the part, the part that I remember is waiting in, all day in line for it. Um, because you don't have the juice or Apple really didn't give out review copies in those days to basically. Yeah. So the first iPhone was only to the four newspapers or something, right? It was, um, David Pogue and USA Today and the Wall Street Journal and, um, who else? Oh, and um, Stephen Levy at um, Newsweek, and they may have given out they may have given out phones sort of later after the embargo date to, um, you know, Engadget, which was was a big site then, and um, Gizmodo maybe, but um, in general, you know, and other like print tech magazines, but in general, I mean, I don't think I got anything from Apple when I was at Salon or Slate. Um, my relationship with Apple, you know, completely changed after coming to the Times. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So Slate, you moved to Slate in 2008. Um, is that sort of, I, I remember reading you at Salon, but this, the, I feel like my conception of you as a columnist, right? So again, I'm, I'm thinking of you as a blogger at Salon, but um, is it at Slate that like you, you sort of get into yeah. this role as columnist? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I've been doing essentially the same job of writing a tech column, a weekly tech column, since I started at Salon, which was 2008. Um, and yeah, I really sort of learned the job of like being on top of the news, planning columns, figuring out what's interesting, well, what give, people are going to like. Give me a definition. What is a what does a tech columnist do that's different than what a tech reporter does? Aside from the tech reporter breaks news but like what are you doing are you an explainer to people or what yeah the way i think about it is sort of part explainer part um futurist part um moralist like at the times like often the role is like you like a scolding tech industry um uh 
and part like advocate for users of technology. I think about it as um, taking a broader view of what's happening in in tech and broader view of sort of that week's news and trying to, um, you know, explain to readers what the implications of, of whatever the developments are, um, might be. Um, so I'm going to, I want to come back to the, the idea of, of, of your job and what you do or whatever. I'm going to, let me, let me finish out the chronology. So then briefly you're the wall street journal, uh, tech columnist after Mossberg leaves, but that's only for six months. And then you're the New York times. Is there a interesting story there or, or how does that work out? Yeah, it's not such an interesting story. So um, I was at Slate. The the sort of Mossberg and Kara Swisher were affiliated with the journal. You know, Mossberg's column ran in the journal, right. but they were working for All Things D, and they were going to leave. Um, well, I think, yeah, so they were sort of, they were just forming their own thing. And so the journal was rehire was hiring positions for all of those, and one of them was a tech columnist position, and um, and I got that job, and it was great. It was totally fun. It was different, totally different from what I was doing at Slate because, I mean, the column was similar, but um, it was just kind of a culture shock of um, it was a much bigger place, and I had to figure out what I was doing there, and um, and they had a paywall, like figuring out how to write for a paywall audience was was unusual. Um, uh, but it was not bad. I had no um, negative experience. Uh, it, the thing that happened is um, shortly after I got that job, uh, David Pogue uh, left the New York Times. And I have always wanted to work for the New York Times. Mm. Um, like it's just sort of what I wanted to do forever. And I had I, I had contacts at the Times because while I was at Slate, um, I was also writing for the Times for um, like different sections, not the tech section, but I knew the tech editor there and I just sort of knew a lot of people at the Times. And so they called me and <laughs> it was very awkward because I was interviewing at the Times after I just started at the Journal and um, they offered me the job and I couldn't say no. Um, so, you know, it was embarrassing and like awkward but it was sort of an obvious decision for me well you know you're in a essentially uh it's not an industry but you're in a, a niche that is not very old i mean it's basically invented by walt mossberg yeah um, and, and also david pogue or whatever so stepping into david pogue's shoes like are, are there people even today that like you you feel like you're if i can if i can just write as good as as this person or if i can be as influential as Walt or something like that? Are there people that you look up to in terms of doing this? You mean people who currently do it? You mean people who used to do it? Well, I guess maybe the question is, is like when you get the New York Times job, who is it that is like your role model? Like, I want to be this good. Oh, um, you know, I, I'm like a huge fan of Mossberg and Pogue, but I also thought that, you know, I needed to do something different. Um, like my column is very different from David Pogue's. He focused almost exclusively on personal technology and right. on products. It's more, uh, it was more like reviewing actual yeah. gadgetry and things like that. Yeah. Right. And so my, um, my pitch to the New York Times was that we should stop doing as many gadget reviews. And now I don't, I basically do none um, because the kind of the gadget review business seemed to be, um, it seemed to be dying for a few reasons. One, like mostly because of Amazon, right? Like you, you want a product, you just look at the Amazon ratings. Um, also the wire cutter had started around right, then. Yeah. It didn't seem as useful. Um, and, and meanwhile, technology was becoming sort of a deeper part of everyone's life. And so sort of explaining the bigger implications of technology seemed more interesting. So that was my pitch to the Times. And so when I got there, I felt like I felt like I was trying to do something that 
was was more similar to what I was doing at Slate, basically. Um, it was slightly different in that I had a wider audience and the everything I wrote was sort of more scrutinized. But um, but the I didn't sort of try to. I don't think there was anyone I was trying to sort of emulate. Um, I think that the person in tech reporting that I kind of admire most and admired most at that time is still the same person that I admire most, which is who's um, Kara Swisher. I, was, I, think I, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she is, um, she's the best tech journalist. She's the best tech journalist. She's the both... best journalist full stop. Kind of working <laughs> today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, she sort of um, created a model for how to do this well and also created a publication, um, a set of publications um that sort of suggested how tech publications should work. Um, and, uh, yeah, I also, um, I mean, the other tech pub publications that I read a lot, um, that I don't read very much anymore, but you know, the kind of heyday of Gizmodo, I was a big fan of. Um, and, uh, the like Engadget that then turned into like the verge, the verge uh, yeah. Um, you know, I still read, um, and I would say Neelai is, you know, I'm a big fan of ne what Neelai does. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I am curious about process. Uh, so it's a, it's a weekly column, right? It is. Yeah. So does that mean that you have a weekly deadline? For example, <laughs> we pushed this recording back in the afternoon. Did you have a deadline this morning? I did have a deadline and it was actually, um, the second thing that I wrote this week because, the thing, the other thing about working at a newspaper is you have to write about the news. So <laughs> it's a weekly column, but often there's news. And so I would say, you know, at least once a month, but sometimes twice a month and sometimes more. I write more than once during a week. Um, so this week is I wrote that, are, Is that your editor saying we need some, we need something on this? Or is that you being like, this is something that I need to, I have something to say about it's half and half. I mean, sometimes it's the editor suggesting it, and other times it's me saying that I have a original or interesting thought about this piece of news that can't wait. I mean, the other thing that's just um, happened in the last couple of years is that the news cycle has gotten so fast that you can't, um, it's hard to have a weekly column because you can't, there's a lot of stories that you can't just wait for um, commenting like next week. If something happens today, um, I can almost certainly, uh, you know, predict that it's going to be out of the news next week and then it'd be too late mm -hmm. to say something. So often you have to, I have to write more than once just because like a subject won't be timely anymore. So does that, does that color, like if you have a big, I, I have a big idea piece, it's going to take me a month or so to put together. I might have to interview two or like, I'm thinking of like, you, you know, pieces I've seen you do about like uh, self-driving cars and things like that. Like, does that make it difficult to, plan out in terms of um no i mean the way that i work is um i have i'm usually working on two or three longer term ideas at a time and by working on i mean i'm sort of like making calls or visiting people or or traveling if it requires it um and and then i try to fit those ones into um into weeks where there's not news so um and then so I would say about half of the columns are maybe like two thirds of the columns are reactive to the news. Um, and then the others are, um, sort of longer term ones. Um, sort of in terms of the job of, of journalists generally, um, again, I said, I thought of you as a blur. I, th I think of you, there's people like Ezra Klein, even like ta Coates to a certain extent mm -hmm. where I, you know, I, I grew up reading you guys and I was reading you online. I felt like you were ta was, was definitely a blogger for many years, you know? Um, and now you guys are like the media establishment. And I always sort of felt like <clears throat> I still sort of get a kick out of that. I lo look at all these guys I came up with there. They, they run the show now, but go ahead. What, what do you want to say about that? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember I talked to Ezra once about, I wrote a column at Slate about how to be a good blogger. And I talked to Ezra about it, about his um, technique. And then, and then, and it frustrates me 
a little that he's not a blogger, especially um, also Matt Iglesias, uh, right, yeah, who yeah. now writes this daily newsletter, which is kind of like a blog. But when but when he blogged, what was great about it was um, he just wrote about anything. I mean, this was also the tr true of the heyday of Gawker, too. Um, people didn't have beats. They just kind of wrote about what they thought was interesting. And um, even the slightest mm -hmm. sort of thought made for a post. And you don't see a lot of that anymore. And the main reason you don't see that is because people just put their thoughts on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, like a small thought is a t is a tweet and a big thought is a column. And so and a much bigger thought is like a, a magazine story, a long form thing. And so the room for kind of the blog post the short in and out and not perhaps fully thought out thing but it was just kind of a small idea i think that has gone away um and and there's also there's less um there's less kind of commercial imperative to do it um uh, maybe not i don't know everyone has everyone sort of still has like aggregation and writes small things but the kind of um bloggy type items that's yeah that's totally been cons you know subsumed by twitter uh i want to mention your book <clears throat> which i will <clears throat> sorry i will admit i have not fully read but i dipped into it's called true enough learning to live in a post-fact society it's available on amazon um and it came out in what 2008 2008 yeah all right so i want to give you credit for something because the first line of this book says that at the same time that technology and globalization has pushed the world together, it's driving our minds apart. And then like literally <clears throat> a couple pages beyond that, you say like, no longer are we merely holding opinions different from one another. We're also holding different facts. Increasingly, our arguments aren't over what we should be doing, the Iraq war, blah, 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 blah. It's about instead over what is happening. So Jesus Christ, dude, <laughs> in 2008, <laughs> like yeah. you're, you're literally calling everything, well, not everything, but, but a, a hell of a lot of things that are super relevant right now. What were you seeing when you're writing that book in 2006, 2007? Like what were you, because I, I even went into the index, like MySpace gets one mention, but there's no mention for Facebook, which makes sense because Facebook isn't a thing yet. So what were yeah. you seeing in 2007 that, has proved out a decade later. So um, the idea for the book came about in 2003 and 2004. Um, wow. When, uh, so the kind of big events that happened around then, obviously the Iraq war, the um, 2004 presidential election, mm -hmm. and the um, aftermath of uh, September 11th, where there were lots of conspiracy theories about September 11th. So all of those stories, uh, Iraq war, um, um, the 2004 election and 9-11, were just um, havens for conspiracy theories. There were lots of people saying lots of things about um, that uh, online about those events. And, the, well, um, and you even get into in the book a little bit of things like um, like what we call anti-vaxxers and things like that, like the yeah. idea, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they were also um, sort of coming up online then. And um, and the thing that I noticed was that um, in any kind of controversy, there was enough information online that you could find your own truth for whatever story there was, and you can kind of live in that bubble um, you know, what has been come to be called a filter bubble, um, because there were both like algorithms directing you that way based on your preferences. Um, and also because there was nothing, there was no kind of overall, um, mainstream trusted source in the media anymore that would, um, you know, limit your exposure to other, um, to kind of crazy ideas or, um, trying to counteract them. Um, in the book, I get into a lot of the, the book is mostly about sort of all of the things in human psychology that allow you to believe things that aren't true. And, um, you know, gives you, give you the sense that the media is biased against your ideas, um, and gives you, um, you know, this, uh, incentive to, um, to, to just not sort of care more about um, things that you feel rather than things that are true. This is uh, Stephen Colbert's truthy, tr truthiness idea. Um, 
so these ideas were around then. Um, you know, truthiness was coined in 2005, I think. Um, so it was a big, you know, it was something that people talked about during the Bush administration. Yeah, and... but my, that, that's, my, that's my thing is my memory of it was that people thought about those things in relation to the Bush administration and how maybe yeah. they, they were the ones that were lying. But you were already seeing that it was endemic in everything and we were already lying to ourselves and it was already being abetted by culture. Right. I mean, so um, one of the things that I covered a lot in Etzelon was um, technology about elections. So those uh, there was sort of lots of controversy about um, the new voting machines and they lacked a paper trail. And after the 2004 election, there was this question of whether George W. Bush had stolen the election because in Ohio they used um, uh, these new voting machines. Uh, and Seibold or something was the company? Or... Diebold. Yeah. Diebold, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I spent a lot of time kind of looking into those claims. And what I found was, you know, there was a very um, active conspiracy theory group on the left that believed that George W. Bush had stolen the election um, and, you know, had had created and found, claimed to find evidence that supported it and were, um, you know, they had blogs and message boards and just lots of, um, you know, lots of stuff online that um, this there was a very active community about that conspiracy theory. So it was not at all limited to, um, you know, people on the right um, and, you uh, and there were just there were there were sort of currents in the news like there were there were just many many stories where it was turning out that the key difference between people the kind of people on each side of the story was not um, you know their differences of opinion after they looked at the same facts but it was that they were just considering different facts and it was around in 2004 and 2005 that even pollsters started to find that you know republicans and democrats started disagreeing about um you know what they thought the unemployment rate was mm -hmm. so like real facts in the world where um people started to have different ideas about those so you know it, it, it I, while writing the book, so I wrote the book in 2006, 2007, and I think this probably happens if you write any book that you sort of, at some, you spend so much time with the material that you start to kind of doubt your ideas and your thesis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I wrote a whole book saying that it seemed like politicians and public figures no longer paid any price for not telling the truth and that you could, you know, lie freely and people will just sort of believe what they want to believe. Um, and then, um, it came out early in 2008 and then, you know, obviously Barack Obama won in 2008 and his was a campaign that was, you know, by sort of objective measures, more truthful. Um, there was, a there was sort of a lot of anti-Obama, you know, birther rumors, um, and those didn't seem to work really. Um, and so after the book came out, I wondered, like, maybe I was totally wrong. Maybe that's not going to happen. Um, then we got into, you know, 2009, the healthcare debates, um, the death panel stuff. And since then, this sort of thesis has just taken off. So I would say the book is, was a little early. Um, I was just going to say the amount of times that I have people on the show that it's like, oh, it was just ahead of its time. They're talking about companies and technologies that are ahead of its time. Yeah. But this is literally, uh, I, this is why I wanted to bring it up to give you credit for you had this right. <laughs> you just had the timing slightly off. Yes. Um, in, I mean, it's not good to be right about that. Like, you don't feel good about being right about that yeah, kind of Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we're wrapping up, but I also want to give you and <clears throat> Jay credit uh, for my favorite since you started it, um, Tech News Wrap-Up Show, the Jay and Farhad Show, uh, the best uh, tech uh, podcast, tech news podcast roundup. And I want to tell you why it's great. <laughs> okay. Because everybody... Everybody does a news roundup and they get three or four people around a table and we throw out the ideas and... What's your take? What's your take? What's your take? The reason you and Jay are, are great is because you reliably on every topic <clears throat> probably have 
a different opinion on each and every topic. And I'm not just talking about him bullying you, which seemingly everyone loves to do <laughs> when they come <laughs> on that show. But I'm talking about legitimately, it doesn't matter what it is. And it's not always that you fight, you know, like I tweet at you guys. I love it when mommy and daddy fights. But like legitimately, yeah. any any topic will come up and he'll have a take and your take will, might might be diametrically opposed, but it'll be different than his. And I can't stress to other <laughs> tech roundup shows that that's so key. If, if everyone's just basically going to be saying the same thing, having three or four people at the table is meaningless. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I don't think we set out to, uh, to disagree with, with each other that much. And, and, you know, we often joke on the show that we don't, um, plan and it's right. just totally true. We really don't plan. Um, well, how did the, and, how did the show get started? Are you guys good friends? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> well, then who, who's, whose idea was it? He, it was Jay's idea. He suggested it and I was like, okay, let's do it. And then we just started doing it. Like we didn't, um, we it's not it's not sponsored or kind of connected to either of our jobs um and it's not sponsored in any way we make no money out of it we just like mate do a phone call and record the phone call um and we sometimes like it's it used to be kind of a weekly thing but since we've both gotten busier we do it kind of more sporadically although we should try to do it weekly um and uh we just like DM on Twitter asking when the other one can do a call and then we just get on the phone and start talking about um, whatever. Well, you know, you mentioned like um, and Gadget into the Verge, like that to me is the gold standard of a, of a tech news roundup when it was Josh Sapolsky, uh, Neelai and, and, and Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and because they all, that's, that's another example. They all three of them, it's not that they fought, but they had different takes on every topic. Um, so yeah, listen, anybody listening, if you're not listening to Jay and Farhad, sh Farhad show, it's, it's great. Um, Thank you. Uh, so you and I, as I said, we're the same age, so I'm turning 40, uh, next month and you are, you're going to be turning 40 later this year. Uh, yes. Is, uh, being the tech columnist for the New York times, something that you want to be doing for decades? Oh, I don't know. Um, maybe. Hmm. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what'll happen in this crazy business? Um, I like my job. It's totally fun. Sometimes it's um, very stressful uh, because I'm not quite in charge of my schedule because the news is in charge of my schedule. Um, but uh, I hope to be doing it for the foreseeable future. I don't know what I want to do in, in, in the long run. Well, so, and, and I always end with uh, asking people what they're interested in because every other show is like, oh, predict for me what's going to happen in the next year or whatever. Um, but I'm more interested maybe in what you're interested in covering in the next year. Is there something coming up that you're like, I, I want to learn more about this or, or, or something like that? Um, hmm. We're in an odd time in the tech industry where nothing is super exciting, mm. but there are exciting things kind of in the like distant future. Um, so I don't know. Like I, I, I <laughs> this is a bad answer, but I'm I'm totally interested in how Alexa becomes an operating system. Yes. It feels That's like an excellent answer, dude. <laughs> Come on. Well, okay. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this the other day. It's such an interesting, it's such a weird uh, um, kind of technology. I don't remember a technology before that was run completely from the cloud, so it could be put in essentially any device for free. Um, so it's like a mix between Android and um, iOS because they have their own proprietary devices. And also it has this weird app model where anyone can create apps for it um, without approval and those apps work on every device without, um, every device that you have without installation on each of the devices. Um, so it's, it's like a, it's kind of like a viral operating system that works anywhere, um, on multiple devices 
And uh, um, it's just super interesting how that spreads and how that grows. Well, and you know, I, I saw a tweet today that talking about how it's the fastest adopted technology or whatever, which is which is always I'm dubious of because people roll that out for seemingly every technology. But thinking about how, like, if if we can believe Jeff Bezos, it really is this bestseller. The idea that maybe are we primed now for we're all early adopters? <laughs> like, is it like, oh, what's the new thing? I want it. Let's let's all buy that. Like, and, as opposed to taking the old idea that a new technology would come around and you would have the early adopters and then it would seep into the mainstream. Like, are we in a new era when that's that's done and we're all adopters now? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Hmm, I hadn't thought about that. Because Perhaps. This, the, 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 uh, you know, this is anecdotal or whatever, but like, do you remember, like, I never would have imagined that my mother would have a smartphone. Like, I was skeptical that that would be a use case for normal people for certain things. I never expected her to be on Facebook or whatever. So that old time frame of, well, of course the kids are on it. Of course I'm on it. I'm into tech, but I don't. And then, and then everyone's on it. We're now like, it's the first time with, with Alexa, especially where it's like, there was no question my parents were going to get an Alexa for themselves. I didn't prompt them to do it. They did it. No. Well, I think one of the interesting things about um, the Echo and Alexa is that it sort of overturns that old model. I think that older people get more out of it um, in an interesting way. Like yeah, that's interesting. Le the less you, you use a smartphone, the more you might get out of it. Um, and it doesn't seem like a device. It's not a device aimed at um, kids or young people. Like kids or young people can use it. My kids love it. But it's not something that like, uh, it's not like Snapchat, for example, like adapted by the young. Um, it's one of the few devices I think actually that seems better for older people. Um, and from what I know, kind of anecdotally, people buy it for their parents and their parents are like hooked on it. And like, it's so easy to use as a piece of technology that kind of, um, there's, there's just very little, um, learning curve, which is, you know, people who, which is why you get that kind of early adopter, yeah, um, yeah. uh, you know, site dynamic, um, because there's sort of nothing, Nothing that like an expert can do on Alexa that like a uh, amateur can't do. Um, you don't really get that same kind of difference in the kinds of users. Interesting. Um, all right, Farhad, listen, I uh, I look forward to reading your your big take on on Alexa, your opus on Alexa. One more question. I I thought uh, at some point you were going to have another book coming out. Or is there ever going to be? Are you ever going to write another book? Yes, I am going to go on book leave later this year. Oh, to, I didn't know that. Um, I'm writing about uh, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft, and Google. The the uh, the death match in the octagon, essentially. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that sounds like exactly the book that I'll want to read someday. So, fantastic. <laughs> Um, Farhad, All right, thanks. Farhad Manju, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast, and um, can't wait for that book. Great to be here. Thanks a lot. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great Internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, and my personal Twitter is at brianmcc. Thanks for listening.